Hello everyone, it's Dr. Omide again. So we continue with our series on the pelvic viscera and I'll start with a recap on the prostate gland. I had done some introduction. Um, it's a largest accessory gland rich with um, fibromuscular stroma. It has a, uh, it located at the bladder neck and usually surrounds the prostatic urethra. And we have the prostatic sheath that has a uh, that is continuous with the superior fascia of urogenital diaphragm inferiorly and the rectovesicle um, septum posteriorly. The prostate has different surfaces, a posterior surface, anterior surface, and an inferior lateral surface, and its apex faces downwards while the base faces upwards. It has two capsules. The inner capsule is a true capsule that is fibrous and contains prostatic plexus of nerves and vein, while the fourth capsule is located um, external to the true capsule, and it's a fibrous prostatic sheath. The prostate has different relations. Superior to it is a urinary bladder. Inferior to it is a urogenital diaphragm. Anterior to the prostate is a pubic symphysis and the puboprostatic ligament, while posterior to the prostate lies the seminal vesicles, vast difference, the rectum and the rectoprostatic or the denovellus fascia. Through the prostate, we have the prostate urethra and lateral to it, we have the levator ani. So this is the prostate gland. Through the prostate is the prostatic urethra. Anterior to the prostate is the pubic symphysis and the fat, and posterior to the prostate is the seminal vesicles and the vast difference together with the fascia denovellus. Inferior to the prostate is the urogenital diaphragm and superior to the prostate is the urinary bladder. Lateral to it is the levator ani, which cannot be shown in this uh, pelvic hemisection. The prostate is divided into lobes by prostatic urethra and ejaculatory ducts. It has five lobes. All the five lobes are glandular except the anterior lobe that is mainly fibromuscular. So the anterior lobe is in front of the urethra while the uh, posterior lobe is posterior to the urethra. The median lobe is between the urethra and the ejaculatory duct, while the posterior lobe is behind the urethra and below the ejaculatory duct. The la left and right lateral lobes lie on each side of the urethra. So this is the anterior lobe, anterior to the urethra, while the posterior lobe is posterior to the urethra but below the ejaculatory duct. Above it is the median lobe. Then on each side we have the right and the left um, lobes. This is the ejaculatory duct, and that's the prostatic urethra. The prostate is supplied by internal pedendal artery, inferior vesicle artery, and middle rectal artery, and its lymphatics uh, follow uh, into the, drain into internal iliac and sacral lymph nodes as well as external iliac lymph nodes. The prostatic venous plexus are located between the prostatic capsule and the sheath, and these usually drain into internal iliac veins and communicate to the vesicle venous plexus of the bladder and the vertebral venous plexus. The prostate is innervated by autonomic nervous uh, system through the inferior hypogastric plexus. So these are the blood vessels to the prostate. This is the bladder, this is the prostate. So you can appreciate inferior vesicle artery from internal ilia coming to supply vessels from the, the, um, to the prostate. So this is just to show you the false capsule, then the true capsule. So within the capsule, you find the prostatic venous uh, plexus, and this is the prostate gland itself. So again, this is the prostate gland, this is the prostatic urethra, and remember we said in the prostatic urethra, the prostate gland will open through the prostate utricle and you also have the uh, openings of the ejaculatory ducts. So this is the uvula of the bladder, the urethral crest and openings of prostatic ducts in the urethral sinus. And this is what we call the seminal colliculi that has a prostatic utricle and the openings of the ejaculatory duct. Again, this is the seminal colliculi that has prostatic utricle and openings of ejaculatory ducts, and these are openings from the uh, prostate uh, glands. This is the urethral crest. So we have uh, BPH and we also have prostate cancer. BPH is benign prostatic hypertrophy, enlargement of the prostate that occurs in middle aged men at around 40 years, mainly involving the median lobe. Remember, it's this median lobe. Uh, we said it's located between the urethra and the, and, the, and the ejaculatory duct. Usually it projects into the urinary bladder. Uh, this enlarged prostate uh, enlargement projects into urinary bladder and obstructs the prostatic urethra.
Prostate cancer occurs in old age, and usually the posterior and the lateral lobes are involved. So usually when you do a digital rectal exam, the prostate can be palpated, and the cancer can spread to iliac nodes and the sacral nodes, and also spread to the vertebral column, to the brain, through the venous, vertebral venous channel. Then we'll discuss the seminal vesicle. This is usually a lobulated organ, two inches long, and lies posterior on the posterior surface of the urinary bladder. It joins the vas deferens to form ejaculatory ducts on each side. Remember, vas deferens was coming from the epididymis in the, in the scrotum. So vas deferens, the posterior part of the bladder, will join seminal vesicle and form ejaculatory ducts that will open on the prostatic urethra. The arterial supply of seminal vesicle is by inferior vesicle artery and middle rectal artery, while the venous drainage is into the internal iliac vein. The lymphatic drainage uh, is by the internal iliac lymph nodes. So again, this is the vas deferens. So from the scrotum, vast difference is a continuation of epididymis. It will uh, uh, be a content of the spermatic cord, pass through inguinal canal, and then we see the vast difference posterior to the bladder here, and it will be joined by the seminal vesicle to form ejaculatory ducts, and these ejaculatory ducts open on the prostatic urethra. So ejaculatory ducts are less than one inch long and are formed by union of duct of seminal vesicle and vas deferens, and they pierce posterior uh, surface of the prostate, opening into the prostatic part of the urethra. So this is the ejaculatory duct formed by vas deferens and seminal vesicle, opening on the posterior part of the prostatic urethra. Then we go now to the applied anatomy of all these. Uh, um, parts of the pelvic viscera. So I'll start with the rectum. So we have colorectal carcinoma, uh, cancer of the rectum and the colon, and this may spread through lymphatics or through blood to the liver. Then it may also spread to the structures that are nearby, like the cervix, vagina, prostate, urinary bladder. So this is why the relations of this organ are important. Then remember, we talked of um, the rectum being supplied by superior and inferior rectal uh, vessels. So we have internal and external hemorrhoids. Hemorrhoids are just enlarged uh, rectal uh, veins. So the internal hemorrhoids are due to enlargement of tributaries of superior rectal veins covered by mucosa, while external hemorrhoids are um, varicosities of tributaries of inferior rectal veins that are covered by skin. Hemorrhoids are usually an important sign in portal hypertension. So these are internal hemorrhoids within the anal canal. External hemorrhoids, you can see them um, going outside the anal canal. So these are external hemorrhoids. These are internal hemorrhoids. So this is how it looks like. Next, when doing a digital rectal exam, you pass a finger through the uh, inners to the rectum and you tend to palpate uh, some structures. That's why you need to understand what are the relations of the rectum. So during a digital rectal exam, you can palpate the prostate. You can see the prostate here. In females, you can palpate the cervix. Then you can also palpate sacrum, coccyx, ischial spine, ischial tuberosities, the ureter, internal iliac nodes, and the contents of the rectal uterine and rectal vesicle and ischial rectal fossa. The rectum can be examined also by a rectoscope. Then we have rectocele, which is a, a just herniation of the rectum, and this is seen in three conditions. You can have it in malnourished children who have trichuris, trichuria, females who have fibromuscular um, layer of uh, posterior vaginal wall when it's weak or due to weakening of the pelvic diaphragm. So again, this is um, cystocele, where the bladder um, is herniating to the through the vagina, but you can also have rectocele where you have a prolapsed rectum into the uh, posterior through the posterior wall of the vagina. Then you have anorectal malformations due to embryonic uh, def uh, anomalies that can occur. So you can have anal atresia. Remember, atresia is like um, failure to canalize. So you can have failure of canalization of the anus, you can have imperforate anus. Um, you can have rectovaginal or rectovesical fistula. A fistula is just a communication a channel between two epithelial lined surfaces. Then we have fissure in anal. This is in chronic constipated individuals. So the anal valves and mucosa are usually torn because the fecal matter is very hard. 
And this tear it occurs in fear to anal valves and is usually very painful because of somatic innervation. Remember we said the embryonic origin is from proctodium, so innervation is somatic by inferior rectal nerve. So this is how a fissure, it's like a tear on the anal canal, it's very painful, and this is how it looks like. It's called fissure in anal due to chronic constipation, tear in the mucosa. Then we have perianal abscesses, and most of the time they occur due to infection of anal fissure that may spread to the ischiorectal fossa or pelvis forming an abscess. Remember this is the ischiorectal fossa, we said it's usually um, uh, between the uh, is your pubic ramus or tureta internus laterally and medially you have the levator ani muscle. So this is the um, ischiorectal fossa. So you can form an abscess in the ischiorectal fossa, you can form an abscess between the internal and external sphincter or you can form a perianal abscess. Abscess is just collection of pus. You can have a superior uh, supralevator abscess which is pus above the levator ani. Then you also have anal fistula. Fistula we've said uh, uh, channel communication channel between two epithelial line surfaces and this is caused by spread of infection so one end opens into the anal canal the other end can open into either of these abscesses either ischiorectal or intersphincteric abscess so the anal fistula can be of different types you can have submucosal fistula from submucosa to submucosa or you can have intersphincteric fistula passing between internal and external um, sphincter you can have transphincteric passes through both sphincters you can have suprasphincteric passes above the sphincter or extra sphincteric from the rectum avoids the sphincter but there is communication outwards through the skin so two epithelial line surface through the GI, either the anus and rectum, to the skin, but depending on which part it passes through. You can also have prolapse of the uterus, and this is where the uterus descends into an abnormal inferior level, and the cervix will protrude through the vagina. Look at this. These are that protrusion, and mainly this is caused by tearing of pelvic floor during uh, delivery. Gartner cyst and duct, I showed you, these are remnants of the mesonephric duct um, in female, but if they persist, you get ducts of gutners, and if, if you are filled with fluids, they form cysts. Then we have ovarian cysts. These are just ovarian follicles, but uh, abnormal if you form many of them, and they occur at various sizes. They are so large, and usually they may require oophorectomy, and oophorectomy is removal of the ovaries, and if after you remove the ovaries, remember to give your patient hormonal replacement therapy because ovaries are important in production of estrogen that helps uh, the females. So usually ovarian seeds, if they are very big, they can be very painful and have some uh, effects. Tubal ligation is done as a means of contraception. So if you have your fallopian tube, you can actually ligate and cut in between and that prevents the egg from reaching or rather from being fertilized by the sperm. Then cervical dilatation is what is usually gauged during labor. Usually the os is pinhole in naliparous ladies and during labor the cervix softens and it dilates to a maximum of 10 centimeters before it allows the passage of the baby. Hysterectomy is surgical removal of the uterus. So if it has ruptured or big, due to cancer or uterine fibroids, you can remove the uterus. Then we have tubal uh, blockage. The fallopian tube can be blocked, and this is a common cause of female infertility. Most of the time it's because of pelvic inflammatory disease or and um, uh, sexually transmitted infection. So you can check for its patency by introducing a radio-opaque dye uh, through the uterus, and that is what is called hysterosalpingogram. You can have spread of infection from the outside through the vagina to the uterus to the fallopian tubes and into the peritoneum causing peritonitis. Ectopic pregnancies can occur and commonly they are usually in the fallopian tube and this can cause the tube to rupture leading to bleeding into the abdominal cavity and death of the embryo occurs. Okay. Fluid can collect in the fallopian tube. If it's serous fluid, we call that hydrosalpings. If it is blood, it's hemosalpings. If it's pus, it's biosalpings. During ovulation, when you release the egg from the follicle, uh, paraumbilical pain can occur due to stretching off ovarian wall, and this is what you call metal schismas. This is transmitted through the T10 nerve. Thank you very much.